good to hear from the students, isn't it? What a cool prelude. Hey, we have some announcements for you. Uh, this is, like I said last week when I was doing the announcements, this is kind of one of our, our super Sabbaths where we have kind of everything going on. Uh, a lot of stuff, a really, really full day today. And it's just been a good, good month of September ministry-wise here. I want to point uh, the attention to the flowers. Uh, they're from Dick and Carol Clark in memory of their son, Rick, who passed away, I think, five years ago today. So uh, the, the, that's what the flowers are there for this morning. After church today, we want to remind you that it is potluck, and, and maybe you brought something. That's great if you're a visitor today. We also want to make sure that you know that you can, since we haven't done this for a while, the potluck is that way, all right? So just go out the doors here and take a, uh, take a left and just keep walking. Go, you have to go outside under the little breezeway there and into our fellowship hall, and that's where potluck is going to be served, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a fun potluck this week. Like I said, it's a super Sabbath this week, a lot of things going on. We have a guest speaker, Megan Hutchinson, is coming from Southern California, and she just uh, restarted a new, just started a new job at a new church, and she's here today, and uh, she has been working with Fuller Youth Institute and working on some really cool um, ministry for family ministry, for families and for students as well. Her heart is in youth ministry, but as I know, uh, we've talked about before, good youth ministry is great family ministry or vice versa. I'm not sure which one that would go. Okay, so that's a, uh, we're excited about that. And here at Carmichael, especially if you're visiting today, we, we love our families here and we want to make sure uh, that we are giving our families all the tools that, they, that we can to be spiritually equipped and raising their children. Um, the Pathfinders is starting today. They're going to be picking up the offerings, so say hi to them, and most of them are in their uniforms. Uh, and so it's good to have the Pathfinders here. They're going to be meeting this afternoon. And uh, also in the back, you can see uh, their booth, and they are selling vegetarian corn dogs uh, in the back. So go ahead and pick up your order form for the corn dogs, which helps Pathfinders raise money not only for this year, but for their big camp out uh, in Oshkosh four years from now. Uh, for those of you guys, uh, the, after the sermon today, you're like, hey, that was, that was really good stuff. I'd like to find out more about this. Pastor Melissa and I are going to be hosting, a, starting a parenting seminar uh, in the Fellowship Hall after potluck starting at 2 p.m. Okay, so at 2 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall, we're going to be uh, doing that. And that's going to continue on Wednesday nights throughout the rest of October. So all the Wednesday nights in October at SAA, while the kids are playing soccer, we're going to be doing stuff for you guys as adults and parents as well. Hey, the SAA, we want to welcome SAA Music here today. The Sax Quartet was here, and Bel Canto is going to be blessing us as well. SAA is doing a lot of really awesome things, including a, a fun Vespers that we had last night. I believe we had over 80 people here for, for that, for a Vespers concert, and just a good time last night. And just want to thank the parents who helped uh, help grill some, some stuff on the grill, and it was just a really, really good evening last night. Tonight, for the junior high students, there's a gym night at the school at 7 p.m. So if you're in junior high, uh, uh, go ahead and go over to SAA around 7 p.m., and any junior high student is invited to go to that. Uh, Caleb, you just ran in here just in time. I saw that. Uh, Caleb, tell us a little bit about some of the things that's happening uh, out of your office. Cool. Well, as you know, uh, Pastor Keith gets back from his sabbatical on Monday. And so we're going to be starting up a new sermon series this next Sabbath. Um, and to go along with that sermon series, we're going to have small groups. Uh, the sermon series is called The Essentials, Living the Faith We Know. And anytime you're trying to apply uh, ideas or principles, I find it's really good to have people that are helping support you in that. So you're not doing it, to, you're not doing it by yourself. You're journeying together trying to apply these truths. So if you're interested in that, uh, please let me know. And we're looking for more leaders. Uh, we have people that are interested in being in a small group. But we're still looking for people that are able to lead one. So if you're one of those people, uh, please give me a call. Talk to me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you about that. 
I feel like there's one other thing you wanted to talk about, and I think it was uh, something going on with your young adult ministry. Some stuff that's coming up with that? It's true. I just gave you the microphone so I could catch my breath. So we also have a potluck today. Um, our first potluck of the year here at Carmichael is after the service. And also we have a young adult potluck over at Steve and Mariella Hahn's house. Uh, we, any young adults ages 18 to 38, that's our, our margin. Um, you're welcome to come join us. We'd love to have you there. Uh, if you're interested, come talk to me afterwards or uh, just meet us there. All right, thanks. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, you can talk to you afterwards about directions, uh, those kind of things, and uh, I'm 39, so I can't go. Thanks. Appreciate that a lot. All right. Um, so there's uh, some really cool stuff happening next week, you're, and you, don't worry. We, Wednesday night out is, we're ready for this. You're going to see a really cool uh, flyer in the bulletin next week about all the options for that. I do want to really mention that uh, if you're going to be playing our kids' soccer, if your kids want to play soccer, we need those registration forms. Jilly, I think it is uh, September 25. Okay, so sep September 25. And we're trying really, 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 really hard not to do on-site registrations that night. Okay? So that's, we'd like to not have that happen because it takes out of the time for the kids playing soccer. Uh, also, we have a play group. Check out your bulletin uh, for that up in Apple Hill that's coming up uh, in this week, uh, as well as a marriage encounter weekend uh, that's happening uh, through one of, the, one of the church members here is hosting that and is in charge of that, and the Wilts do a great job uh, with that. So please, if you're interested in a marriage encounter weekend or you'd like to help sponsor someone or you know someone that should go to that, please go ahead and do that. And in your bulletins, you'll see a card for our 50th anniversary that's coming up. We wanted to, our, our anniver 50th anniversary kind of uh, committee wanted to make sure that you knew that was happening. Some of you have already been reserving for the dinner online. It's a free dinner. Uh, and so you can go ahead and go online and reserve your spot for that. We do have a limited amount of spots available. And that dinner is in December. I know that's a long way away but we are already close to 50% reserved for that, all right? So if you haven't gone in and reserved your spot for that anniversary dinner, you wanna do that. Now with that card that you have in your bulletin, you, maybe you can send that as a postcard to somebody that you know might not know about this uh, event, uh, or you can just put it on your refrigerator to remind yourself about that. Dan, come on up and tell us about our ministry celebration. How many of you know what NCC education is? A few of you. Northern California Conference Seventh-day Adventist Education Department. I did not know that there's over 250 educators in that Northern California Conference system. 38 K through 12 schools, five ECEC schools, early childhood education and care centers. We have one at SAA. I would suggest you go to that website, www.nccheducation.org. First thing you'll find on there is a 10 plus 10. They're setting a goal to raise, you ready for this? $240 million over several years. 10% tithe, add another $10 20,000 families doing that for a year is 2.4 million. That represents 10, 24 million represents 10% of the budget that NCC operates. If they, if they, their goal is to pay all of the salaries of all the teachers, which would lower tuition, every 10% would lower tuition by 7%. That's a big number. I quickly backed into it since I was a wannabe math wizard and figured out that the budget is probably $350 million a year for Christian education. Could we agree that probably the best educational system in the world is the Adventist education system? Today the offering is for that. If you wanted to go for that specific cause, list that on a tithe envelope. Otherwise the funds will go in the local budget. I have to brag a little bit. If you look in the bulletin, 
bottom of the announcement page. I'm glad Benji didn't bring this up. He talked a lot about SAA. Congratulations to the boys varsity football for being undefeated at the NBA football tournament. And congratulations, the yearbook staff for the PUC publication workshop wins. They won best of photography for a yearbook and they won on-site writing, which was a spontaneous, here's what you write about, write it and you're judged. The reason it's important to me, Natalie Zweigel, my granddaughter, is editor of the annual this year and her assistant editor is Kaylin Tatsuyama, both members here, and they won that on-site impromptu writing of all the schools represented. So our education is awesome. Thank you. I'm really glad I didn't mention that, Dan. That was way better coming from you. All right. In your bulletins, you also have a welcome card uh, and uh, a connect card. So we'd like to make sure, especially if you're a visitor today, you take a look at that and uh, let us know that you're here. And maybe you've been a visitor for the last three years and you're deciding it's time to be a member here. We'd love for you to go ahead and fill that out for that. We also have a weekly e-note that goes out. It's another way that you can sign up. If you're not getting that, put your email address on that connect card. And finally, and most importantly, if you have a prayer request for our church and for our staff, uh, we'd love, uh, we, we really do in, enjoy lifting up all those prayer requests and being uh, part of that, and you're trusting us with that, um, that information. So we spend our Tuesday, the first hour of every Tuesday uh, looking at the prayer, prayers for that. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer as we begin our worship service this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for today. I ask your special blessing on this service today, this, this moment in time that we're spending together as a church community. And God, as, as we, we do worship together, God, I ask that your Holy Spirit be felt, that our ears are opened, our hearts are touched, our minds and our, and our reason is affected and that we are transformed through this time together. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. That was an awkward mic switch. Okay. <laughs> We're going to be singing some hymns this morning, and we'd like to do the first one, hymn number 167. Please stand with us for both of these. Alleluia, sing to Jesus. three verses.
guys sound amazing. One more hymn this morning, and it's hymn number 348. 348, the church has one foundation. church? Amen. I'm looking forward to that day. Uh, let's go ahead and greet our neighbors. Say hi to somebody this morning as we are here in worship.
our scripture this morning. Our, our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among his, their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. It's time now for the children's story. If the kids want to come on down. Our tradition in this church is that we give uh, little dollar bills, you know, the ones with the five zero and the one zero zeros on, just kidding, on them to the children for the children's offering. So they're going to flood the aisles right now and beg you for money, and that's normal. <laughs> Bring those dollar bills up and put them in the little church up front. Okay, kids, find a seat on the stairs. Anywhere, anywhere on these stairs, you can still hear me, and you can probably still see me too. I'm going to tell you guys a story this morning about a time when I was with my babysitter. How many of you guys have ever had a babysitter? Almost all of you. Are those good times or are those bad times? Good times. Those are good times. Well, shh. Guess who my babysitter was when I was a little girl? It was my older cousin. And when she came to babysit us, my parents didn't know this. We tried to do the craziest things we could think of. So this one night when she came, we decided we were going to have a fight. Not a bad fight, but a silly fight. And we had already had a pillow fight. That's boring. We had already had a water fight. That's boring. So we thought, what kind of fight can we have? And we saw sitting, as we were thinking about this, we saw in the kitchen, sitting on the counter, two giant jars from Costco of peanut butter. 
we thought, this is it. Let's have a peanut butter fight. Who here has ever had a peanut butter fight? What a terrible idea. Terrible idea. But we thought this was great. We opened that jar and we scooped out hunks of peanut butter and we threw it at each other. Does peanut butter throw very well? No, it does not. It mostly stays on you. If it gets on the wall, it just kind of sticks there on the wall like that. Yeah, I threw it in my brother's hair, and then we couldn't get it out, and we got on the carpet, and we couldn't scrape it up, and somebody threw it on my harp. Do you know how many strings a harp has? What do you, what do you think, Alex? Nine. Times like five. <laughs> a harp has almost 40 strings, and so it was on every single string. And you guys know that peanut butter fight was fun for like three minutes. And then guess what we did for the next whole two hours that my parents were gone? What do you think we did? What do you think we did? Cleaned up. We had to clean peanut butter out of hair and off walls and off strings and off carpet and off our shoes. And I feel like I smelled like peanut butter for a month. Maybe I didn't clean very well. I don't know. But do you guys know that bad choices are like peanut butter? It looks like it's gonna be fun at first, and maybe it's fun for two minutes, and then you spend the rest of your time cleaning up the mess, cleaning up your mistakes, wishing you hadn't done it, feeling guilty. When my mom and dad moved out of that house, there were still stains on that carpet, and every time I looked at them, I felt bad. Not worth it. So let's say a quick prayer today. Let's bow our heads, and let's close our eyes. Dear Jesus, we want to follow your ways. We don't want to live our lives always having to clean up messes. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the fact that it teaches us your way. Give us the courage to follow it. And all the kids said, amen. You can go back to your seats now.
Thank you, Ms. Ms. King. Uh, right now, we're going to have a, a special prayer of blessing, and I'd like to invite any of our adventure leaders, as well as any of our Pathfinder leaders, uh, to go ahead and stand. And I'd like to have Karen uh, come up uh, right now, if, if she's here. And uh, I don't know if Keith, Keith, are you here, Pathfinders-wise? I, I didn't see you earlier today. So if he is, Keith, come on up as well. Uh, but if, there he is. So these are, our, Karen's our adventure leader uh, this year, and uh, she's been doing a great job with that. Is this your third year, Karen, doing that? So it's just been really great seeing adventures uh, just blossom. And uh, same thing with Pathfinders. And uh, we have another, inc a bigger Pathfinder club than last year, I believe, Keith. And uh, God is really blessing. Uh, and for those of you uh, who need to be reminded, Adventurers and Pathfinders is such a great addition to all the other things we do here at Carmichael. Uh, we have a, a great school system. Uh, we have great Sabbath schools. But that, that deep discipleship, and I've told Keith and Karen this m many times, really happened for me uh, even more intentionally through these caring adults that came in and helped me in Pathfinders and Adventurers. Uh, so those are really formative years of, of my life as well. And so I know that's important for the students that are here as well. So Pathfinders has already started. Uh, you're a couple weeks in. You might take a few more people if they wanted to sign up. Absolutely. And, and Adventurers starts today at 2.30. Uh, both of you guys are today at 2.30. So uh, I'd like to have a special prayer prayer of blessing. These leaders are up here as, as the director of these, these things, but there's so many. They'd, they'd be mad at me if I didn't remind all of us that there's so many people that make this happen, so many teachers. Uh, that. So if you're a Pathfinder or adventurer or leader uh, out in the church right now, I'd like to have you stand as well as we have a ch as a church uh, put a blessing on you. So if you're helping out teaching adventures, classes, uh, helping out with Pathfinders, please stand right now. Let's, let's bow our heads. Our dear Heavenly Father, today I just want to say a special prayer of blessing as we begin a new aspect of this school year. It just Every year it happens, but, and it's a great tradition. But God, we just want to specifically right now for this year, for these students, for these leaders, put a prayer of blessing on them and this ministry. Our children, God, are, are so important. There's not too much that we can do. And God, just want to thank you so much for giving us the privilege of being together in a community like this that has Pathfinders, Adventures, and all these other children's ministries. Thank you for the leaders that are out there this, this standing right now for this year. And God, just ask uh, for wisdom for them. Uh, for As they prepare their lessons, work on their honors, that they're able to search their hearts and find ways to introduce who you are to those students in brand new and fresh ways. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Where possible, would you join me in prayer? And shall we kneel? Heavenly Father, we come before you on this beautiful Sabbath day to worship you in truth and holiness, but also to enjoy the camaraderie of fellow believers. Let us leave our personal concerns outside the door and turn our undivided attention to worshiping you. It's the start of the fall season, Lord, and many programs are starting up again, and we need your guiding hand on our pastors and our church staff. Give them creativity and energy, wisdom and conviction, strength and insight into your will. Place a hedge of protection over SAA and the administration, the staff and the teachers and students. A guiding hand over our own programs like Sabbath schools, adventurers, pathfinders, women's ministries and music groups. May our programs bless you and the surrounding community. In 2 Chronicles, Lord, verses, uh, chapter 7, verse 14, you say, 
If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Lord, I claim this promise for Carmichael Church and for our land. The drought has caused so many fires and lost lives. Many people will have to begin again, both physically and spiritually. So Lord, as I represent this congregation to you, hear our humble prayer, taking responsibility for ourselves and recommitting ourselves to you. Heal our hearts and our land, Lord, by bringing the rain, both physical and latter. And now, Lord, I ask a special blessing on Megan Hutchinson as she speaks to us about faith and families. Bless her with a word from you directly, Lord. We love you and we live to serve you. Amen. Would you move, would you move that so I don't fall over it? <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah, let me move it back here. Well, good morning. As we're reworking the wiring so I don't trip over myself, I just wanted to say that I got on a plane this morning at 8 a.m. and by the grace of God made it here in time. I grossly underestimated, because we just moved, the time it would take me to get to the airport and on the plane. So I, thanks be to God, I made it and I'm very happy to be here at Carmichael. Uh, welcome to Sticky Faith. Let me say that again. Welcome to Sticky Faith, developing a faith will, that will last a lifetime in your kids. We're going to, going to do something a little bit differently, as I understand it, in this church this morning, is have outlines. And there are, I think, about 15 blanks, give or take. So if you'd like, it's an option. You're welcome to follow along as I teach this morning. I'm the adult ministries pastor at a church in Newport Beach called St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Before that, I was at a church, small little dinky place called Saddleback Church in Orange County. But probably the most important thing that I get to do is the call of God in my life to be a proud wife and a proud mom. So there's some things that I really want to let you know about, and that is that I am the youngest of four girls. Four girls. In fact, let me just get this up on the screen here so you can see a picture of my family. Wait for it. Password. Got the password. Mm-hmm. There we are. <laughs> we wanted to, there we go. Okay. So I am the youngest of, is it up behind me? Sticky Faith? Wonderful. So I am the youngest of four girls. Four girls. Here's a photo now. Check out my dad's suit. That would go for some significant money today. Would you not agree with me? Some of you are like, I would wear that. And I don't blame you. It's a nice suit. But let's fast forward a couple of decades. 1998 was personally a very, very big year for me. I got married to the love of my life and my best friend, Adam. <clears throat> he calls me Eve. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. And we have two boys, Jack and Parker. Jack is 12. Parker is 8. I know. Ah, oh, right? Ladies and gentlemen, that's not reality. This is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so we have had some really great moments in our home. And I have to tell you that the research that I'm going to share with you today and then some really practical things, practical stuff that you can take home today to your, your immediate kids, grandkids, ne nephews, nieces, if you're a student yourself, some of this thing is going to st start you to think about perhaps a different framework that you may or may not um, be currently working from. So before I jump into that, there's two things I want you to know that my kids said to me, Mom, we really want to know where you're at today. So I just thought that I would start with a group photo. So if you don't mind, house lights lifted, please. We're just going to take a quick group photo. Okay, everybody, come on in. Lean in. Let's do this, everybody. One, two, three. Everybody say hi. 
Thank you so much. That's really great. I appreciate that. My kids will really appreciate that. So, so now that we have that out of the way, I actually want to um, tell you a couple things that have popped up in terms of this research that have been radically, radically important, not just to the country, because there is a wave that is stirring with this movement called Sticky Faith that God himself is breathing his breath into. But it has deeply impacted me and my husband personally in terms of what we do with our own kids and how we love and care for the kids in our church and the surrounding community. So let me just start with this. This is going to be the first fill-in in in your outline. Based on the best research for multiple studies, we have learned that somewhere between 40 to 50 percent of young people from great communities and great families and great churches and great youth groups and great schools will drift from their faith after high school. Almost 50 percent. That's one out of every two. That means that what we need to do is realize that sometimes we adults we, we struggle with this because we haven't planned for students or our own children not to drift away from their faith. This is research. This is facts. And by the way, these kids are not kids who hate their, their seminary classes. These kids are not kids that don't show up to church or actually have intended to drift away from God. In fact, according to Lifeway Ministries, 80% of kids intended to stick with their relationship with Jesus. They intended to find great godly friends and keep them. They intended to find a great church once they left their home. They intended, (laughs) and I think of the word intended, and you know what? I, every Monday, I intend to stick with my diet plan. I really do. I start off so strong, try to do the no carb thing, try to cut out dairy, just trying to rework a little bit about my own eating and making sure I'm healthy for my body type. But by Thursday and Friday, (laughs) I am grabbing everything processed that I possibly can. I reach for the sugar. I reach for the dairy. I'm completely off of it. If I don't have accountability, it doesn't really matter what I intend to do. And we're finding that with these students, that without being intentional, my intentions mean nothing. And so this is what's happening with our kids. 50% of them, when handed the keys keys of faith from high school to college, they didn't know what to do even with the best of intentions. Take a look at this video called Life After High School. High school ministry was a lot of fun. It was a lot easier to follow God because my community was doing the same. All my friends would go there. Um, I was in the worship band. I was this kind of picture-perfect youth group kid. We had a huge youth group. I got to find people that were very similar to me. It was my home. It was my favorite place to be. Well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fall away. Like, that's the last thing I'm going to do, you know? Look at my family, look where I come from, look at the church that I come from, you know? That's the last thing. Faith is central to me. Like, that bubble burst within months. College felt really lonely to come to a place that's so far away from everything familiar. It made me feel very alone and made me feel very insecure. I joined a sorority right when I got to college because I knew that I wanted to make friends. Because I had so much freedom, I really lost all my motivation for school. Students everywhere were under the influence or had drugs or alcohol with them at school, and I was really surprised and not prepared for that. I kind of wanted to try it, not going to lie. I started drinking, I like started partying, I started caring about like what people thought of me a lot, wanting to be skinny, wanting to wear clothes that showed more than probably should have. It turned out to be a lot harder to stay sober than I thought. I ended up compromising my own values, my own beliefs, and ended up getting involved sexually with with girls. Any sense of identity that I was getting from God, I had replaced with this romantic relationship. Losing something that was central to me, which was my virginity. I just, man, that decimated, you know, the rest of the stuff I could I could get back, I could heal from, you know, I could like, I could turn around and get away from, but that's something that's, you know, you can't change that. Uh, And so that just makes it impossible then for me to ever live up to that ideal that I had placed upon myself and that was placed upon me coming into college. My relationship with God was messed up. I didn't really want anything to do with a personal relationship with God because I felt threatened by it and I felt like I would be condemned. My best friends, who I was a roommate with, called me out and said, 
dude, this isn't you. You just get to a point where it gets to be very, um, you achieve very low self-esteem. I'm making decisions here that are hurting myself and hurting other people. And I didn't think myself capable of doing those things. And it wasn't until I needed God's grace that I realized God had been there the whole time just with his hand extended. And all I needed to do was turn around and, and grab it. I kept straying away from him over and over and over. And every single time, he still received me back into his arms. And he's the only one in the universe that would do that. When FYI, Fuller Youth Institute, uh, asked students, what are the top difficulties when you transition from high school to college? They said this, friendship, aloneness, and finding a church. Friendship, aloneness, and finding a church. So what happens? I actually need a volunteer for this. So, mom, would you come and volunteer? Look, she didn't even volunteer. I just said, would you come? I'm just going to put you on the spot. Come on up here really quickly. One of my favorite things about you, what is your name? Donna. Donna has no shoes on. Is this fantastic? You know, just come as you are. Come as you are is what Jesus said, and you are, and I love that. So um, remind me of your first name. Donna. Donna, thank you. So Donna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you that you're, you are going away to college. So what college are you going to choose? Just give me any old college. PUC, P-U-C which stands for? Pacific Union, College. Pacific Union College. Okay, so she's going to go to Pacific Union. That's great. So you're going to go there with your Bible and you're going to learn a lot of good things about God. But something starts to happen while you're here. We're going to talk about what Tim Clydesdale, Clydesdale talks about. He's a sociologist in his research that sometimes when you go away to college, even if it's a great godly college, that the studies show that students will take their Bible and their, which represents their faith and all that you've ever known and all that you've ever grown up with, and they will temporarily place it in what is called, I'll just put this here, an identity lockbox. So while she's away at college, a great college with some really good people around it, her faith is what is called in putting in this identity lockbox. And one of the things that's happening is you're figuring out what is my career going to be? Oh, I might find a mate at this college. Uh, he's cute. He might be the one. Um, and just even career choices. But you're making these major life decisions all while your faith is locked up in identity, lock, identity lockbox. In other words, you're not attaching your faith, your Jesus, your relationship with Jesus to the decisions that you're making. And this is what the research is beginning to show, a lot of beginning to show. So can we please give her a hand right now? Thank you very much, Donna. Appreciate it. The great news about this is that trajectories are being established long before people's senior year. Um, so it's never too late to start talking about a faith that lasts. Welcome to Sticky Faith. Again, I'm going to say it. Welcome to Sticky Faith. Let me give you some more reality, and then I'm going to get really practical with you. Okay, so I don't know what it looks like for your home during Christmas Eve, but here's a picture of my home during Christmas Eve. Again, I mentioned I'm the youngest of four girls, and holidays are a very, very big deal around our home. Now, this is the adults table. You can barely see it. I don't know if you're able to lower those lights up there by chance, but it's really important that you see this table because on this table, you notice, what do you notice? Go ahead, throw it out. Candelabras, china, linen napkins. I mean, is, it, is this not lovely? Would you not agree with me that this is lovely? Beautiful, stunning. My mom buys the best centerpieces in town. I mean, this is something else. This is called the adult's table. Let me welcome you to the children's table. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. This is the kid's table. Now notice, no, no tablecloth. Definitely no candles, uh-huh. Um, paper plates. I don't even think we had napkins. And while the adults' table had, you know, nice, uninterrupted conversations, the kids' table sometimes would have a little food being thrown across the table while they're having fun laughing. Now, <laughs> at Sticky Faith, do you know what we call this? We call this the kids' table catastrophe. Why? Because sadly, that is what has evolved in church communities all over the world. 
In most churches, most, I realize yours may be the one exception, okay? We have the adult worship service and the student worship service. We have the adult pastors and the students' pastors. We have the adult missions trips and the students' missions trips. And here's the problem. In our well-intended effort to offer relevant, meaningful programming for young people, we have segregated them for the rest from the rest of the church. And I hesitate using that warm that word segregate. It's a poisonous word. It really is. And yet we have allowed for a more subtle form of segregation, segregation by age. That's a far cry from what Jesus himself experienced at a young age. And I'm going to repeat a little bit of what our elder Ed Dower said when he spoke from the word of God in Luke chapter 2. I want to take this scripture apart for us just a little bit here. So let's start with this verses 41 and 42 of Luke chapter 2. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the feast festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went to the festival according to custom. Raise your hand if you were in this room and you were 12 years old. Anyone 12? Okay. You were the first one to raise your hand, so you're going to, I forgot what I normally bring, so you just get the rest of my gum. Enjoy it. I think there's one piece left. I'm so glad you're 12. Do you know that Jesus' ministry started when he was 12 years old? Of course you do. You're like, I'm Adventist. I totally know that. Okay, great. Right. I just just wanted to make sure. Some people don't. So that's an amazing thing for you. But here's what's happening. Let me give you a little context of what's happening in the scripture. Um, according to the custom, which is what this verse says, tradition for the boys at rage, right on around the age 11 and 12, um, they experience a number of Jewish cultural and religious truths, as most of you know. And one of the events was traveling towards this feast. It was called the Feast of the Passover. And let's read on. So what happens is, so if you're traveling to this feast, you've heard about this feast from the day you were born from your mom and dad. And as a 12-year-old boy, 11 and 12-year-old boy, you can't wait to go to the feast of the Passover because you know, (laughs) I am becoming a man. This is a rite of passage for me. It's a very big deal. So the passage then continues. After the festival was over, while his parents were still returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on a day, and then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. Now, I have read this passage many of times. Probably you have as well, too. Chances are you have. But maybe it's because I'm a mom now. I have a whole different set of lenses. And I keep thinking as I've read this, what kind of parents are they? What is wrong with them? This is the mother of Jesus. Really? She's missing her kid and she doesn't notice? What in the world? And three days? I would have called the cops. Okay? And and the truth is, I would have been so stressed out as a mother. One of the things I do when I'm stressed is I overeat. So I would have been binging for sure. I mean, a lot of things would have been happening to me as a mom if I've lost my kid for three days in in this culture. But here's the reality. In the first century, men would travel together and the women would travel together to this festival. It was a long journey, depending on where you were from. And the children would go in between the mothers and the fathers. So it was only at the end of the day that Mary looked at Joseph and Joseph looked at Mary and said, where's her son? Where's, Where's Jesus? And note, It wasn't like they could like text each other. Hey, Jesus, where are you? There was no such thing. So what did they do? We read on. When they did not find them, they were good parents. (laughs) They went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, again, three days, okay? They found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Ladies and gentlemen, 72 hours, three days on his own. He's 12. Can you let that sink in for just a moment? I have a (laughs) 12-year-old. Oh my gosh, right? 
Some of the questions I rarely hear asked about this specific, specific passage, but they have to be potential game changers, are this. Where did he sleep? What did he drink? Who made sure he was fed? Again, I have a 12-year-old. He eats a ton. Who fed this kid? We don't know. But based on the tenure of this passage, it seems that the faith community stepped in for a boy who was on his own. It was a community that took care of him. They welcomed him to their table, if you will. They took care of his needs. But they did more than that. They did more than that. Look at what I've underlined here. He listened and learned from them, and they listened and learned from him. The vision of Luke chapter 2 is of a church where generations interact with each other. In other words, where intergenerational worship and relationship were the norm. It was part of daily living, not just on Sabbath, but it was part of how they did life. Let me tell you why this is important. Sticky faith. The findings are amazing. They really are. They've been a game changer, as I said earlier, for my husband and I. Fuller looked, Fuller Theological Seminary looked at 13 different variables with 500 students and followed them for many years. 13 different things kids can do in the context of their churches to help them have sticky faith. And let me briefly tell you the top five findings, not necessarily in order, but I saved the best for last. In fact, I've already tipped my hand to it, actually. So here are the sticky faith findings. The first one is this. Service, you'll be glad to know this, that service and justice is correlated with mature sticky faith. So that missions trip that perhaps you've been putting off, as an aunt, uncle, grandparent, and taking the student, your child with you, or your niece or your nephew, book that, book that trip. It matters and it, it equals, it's part of what equals sticky faith. You'll also be glad to know that being involved in a small group is correlated with mature, sticky faith. So help them to stay, stay consistent and faithful and don't take small group away from them as a consequence. Not a good idea. Number three, this is big. This was an aha for me. Parent-child faith conversations, which allows plenty of room for doubt. Research shows that 70% of kids doubted their faith, but few were able or allowed to or permitted to talk about their doubts. 70%. That's a lot. I don't know how how many kids you have here. How many, generally speaking? Do you know? Give me a number. 300, 200, whatever. 70% of that number. Is it possible that some of them have questions of doubt? And it's not because they're bad. It's not because they're doing anything really wrong, but they're kids. Some of, some of you adults may have some of those questions. We must allow a place that's safe, where doubts are welcomed. Why? Because when they move out or they go away to college, and sometimes when they come back, even from the the Adventist colleges that many of the kids here go to, their faith can get rocked. It just can. Because suddenly they're exposed to a whole new world and they're becoming adults and the religions of this world and the pressures of this culture, thus they begin doubting their own belief system and they can't find a place to belong. In fact, Sticky Faith has come out with a book called Can I Ask That? You might want to write that down. It's Can I Ask That? Great questions that identify some of these doubting questions. So I want to tell you right now, what are some of the questions that students doubt. Here's the top four. Does God exist? Is Christianity true? Is it the only one way? Number three, does God love me and am I living the life God wants? Now notice the first two have to do with this vertical relationship between me and God. And the second two have to do with a horizontal between uh, myself and my, my relationship and my purpose on earth. Parents, Grandparents, nieces, nephews, aunts, uncles, grandparents. I said that again. 
We must allow people the freedom to ask questions about their faith and not being afraid of their questions. Our homes, our youth groups, our children's departments, they must be a place where doubts, fears, and questions can be expressed, and here's the key, without a lecture. (laughs) I hold up the mirror to myself when I say that, okay? Every time I talk about this stuff, I am reminded that God lets me live it before I ever get to teach it. In uh, 19, excuse me, in 2011, Parker, our then five-year-old, was admitted to the hospital for acute pain. And what we found was this kid, Parker, in the hospital bed was, was born with three ureters. <laughs> I always knew he was, spe- was special, but I'm like, God, really? That's different. You know, almost just two and he's got three. And there was a terrible, terrible amount of pain that was caused in his body as a result of this. So many times we would rush to the emergency room and we couldn't figure out what's happening. Well, it got really bad when our son was five. And I know that we did as parents everything that we could have possibly do to help our child. I mean, we, we immediately got, we called people in our prayer circles and said, would you come and pray for Parker? Lay hands on our son fast. Let's do all that we possibly can to get this boy healing. But in the end, he still needed surgery for a partial removal of his right kidney. And in the midst of this painful time, I'll never forget it, our then eight-year-old Jack says, Mom, you know, you, you tell us that God can do anything. Why isn't he healing, Parker? Great question. And it's a question of doubt. You know, before this research, let me tell you how I would have responded. Before this research, I would have said, oh, Jack, pat him on the back. Hey, Jack, honey, you know what I need to let you know? Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to bring you a future and a hope. So we can just trust in Jesus for this. And I just, and he would look at me like, okay. I mean, you know, he's eight. But since the research, my answer is a little bit different. I still love Jeremiah 20, line 11. But I'm careful to quote the context, quote that in context. Because the context of that verse that we often quote is they are in exile. They are slaves. They are in the midst of their own personal, personalized hell on earth. And I don't mean that to be crass. Life is difficult for them. And in the middle of the darkest hour, God says to them through the prophet of Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you. So Parker is in the middle of his darkest hour on that hospital bed in acute pain. And I'm going to look at Jack and I'm going to say, Jack, I don't get it either. And I am so glad that you asked this question because I don't understand why God is choosing not to heal Parker so that we don't have to go through the pain and the surgery and the expenses. But, but Jack, you know what I know about God? He's like, what, Mom? Mom? I've walked with him long enough to know that I can trust him even when I don't understand him. And you don't know that yet because you're eight. And it's okay that you don't. And I still want you to ask me any question you ever want to ask me. But for today, I'm going to ask that you would borrow some of mommy's faith. Because God does things for, in ways I don't see. And it's mysterious, but I trust him. And so, Jack, what I want to invite you to do is, why don't we open up the scripture together? And why don't we look at some of the pain that people have gone through in the Bible and how God chose to answer it? And we did. And you know what we found? <laughs> you know what we found. You know the word of God, most of you. We found that sometimes God chooses to heal, other times he doesn't. But what we found was that God has this gigantic picture in his sovereignty 
and that he always brings people's stories full circle. I don't know where you're at today, you guys. I don't know what's going on in your life. And yeah, this is about sticky faith, but let me tell you something about your own story. That God is a God who doesn't just leave our stories with a giant gap or a giant hole. And you may be sitting in something right now today going, gosh, I remember loving to do that 45 years ago or three months ago. And what happened? I was so passionate about that, Lord, and I miss it. You know what I know about God? That he does not leave a gap in our stories, but he brings our stories full circle in his time and never our own. And you can trust him with everything you've got that he's going to bring your story full circle. Your story is not over with, so take heart. My brothers and sisters in Christ, he knows exactly what he's doing. And you can't see the end of the road, nor can I. Your book is not finished. If you have a heartbeat, if you're still on this earth, your purpose is not yet fulfilled. So you can trust God that he's going to continue to use you. So take hope. Parker's doing fine now. <clears throat> I wish so much you could see that photo because you would have laughed a lot harder. <laughs> but his hair is full of color. And he's just the craziest kid I know on the planet. And I love it. I look at him all the time and say, I love your energy. <laughs> you can drive mommy crazy sometimes, but I love your energy. And in my heart, I'm saying, I'm glad you're alive. So how do we handle and even invite doubts and questions? Let me give you five things quickly. Here they are. Don't freak out. When, when, when somebody that is younger than you asks you a question of doubt. And this is especially for those who live under our own roof. You're not allowed to, have, you're not allowed to freak out. Like, how dare you? Or We believe this our whole life. This is the way we were raised. It's been part of our family forever. It's just not allowed. Not if you want them to have faith that sticks. You have to be able to look at them. I don't ever play poker, but with a poker face, okay? And what I mean by that is just say, wow, that's a, that's a really good question. And either I do have an idea about the answer or I have no idea. But let's figure out the answer together. Do you see the difference? So don't freak out. The second is validate the question. I just modeled for what that looks like to you. And then you invite discussion. And then you welcome ambivalence. In, everywhere, in other words, don't tie every conversation with a pretty bow because some conversations won't have one. It's part of the mystery of God. Sometimes we don't know how things are going to turn out. But we know the God who turns things out the way he does. And number five, seek God's ways or his workings together. The fourth finding in sticky faith, and this is a big one, again, a game changer for me and my husband is this, is Jesus is bigger than any mistake. I'd like for you all to say this with me. Jesus is bigger than any mistake. Now say this with me. Jesus is big, bigger than any mistake I make. Jesus is bigger than any mistake I make. You ready for the last one? Jesus is bigger than any mistake my kids make. Jesus is bigger than any mistake my kids make. You see, most kids view their Christ, view following Christ like a series of behaviors, a list of do's and don'ts. And in our effort to make the gospel tangible and simple, many times we truncate the message of the gospel into what De the late Dallas Willard calls the gospel of sin management. It's managing my behaviors and allowing verses, let me say that again, it's managing my behaviors versus allowing the, the Holy Spirit to transform me from the inside out. But managing my behaviors or our kids' behaviors, it's not the real gospel. Because of the sticky faith research, my husband and I are hoping that talking and even sometimes laughing about our mistakes will make our home a safe place to confess our sin and celebrate the grace that erases them all. One of the ways we do this, really practical, you can do this. You can do this if you babysit kids, whatever kid you have in your life, whether it's your own son or daughter or those who intersect with your life. 
Here's something that you can do. We do this at our dinner table, but you can do this anyway, where, anywhere. We call it our high, low, our God sightings. And it's just something that we have done almost every night when we are around the table. Not that we are around the table every night. We try to do three nights out of the week. That's our goal. But we sit around our table and we say, what's your high? What's your low? What's your God sighting? And since this research, we've added, what's your oops moment? So let me give you an example. Um, this is recently around our table. Now, remember, I live in uh, Orange County. There's lots of water. We surf as a family. In fact, my husband and kids are doing that as I speak <laughs> right now. So we are all gathered around our table one, uh, I think it was a Wednesday night, and we say, what's your high? And it was my turn because my, my son does this. That's the way he tells me it's my turn to talk when it comes to this. We try to make it fun. And I said, well, my high today was going out uh, surfing together as a family. What's your low, Mom? Well, my low is I felt grumpy in the afternoon because I didn't sleep very well. All right, God sighting. Oh, my God sighting was that blue jay that swooped right in front of me because I feel like blue jays are one of the ways that God just shows up in my life. <laughs> you know you're getting older when you think God is a blue jay. But uh, anyway, and then... What's your oops moment, Mom? I look right at Jack, a 12-year-old, and I said, when I yelled at you, Jack, and didn't ask for forgiveness for three hours later, I felt so separated from you because Mom didn't handle that well because I'm tired and I'm so sorry. And he looks at me and says, hey, Mom, we already took care of that. Remember, you asked for forgiveness. We're good. And I'm glad I did, but... If we didn't have that oops moment, what, what am I modeling? What are my husband and I modeling for our kids? I'll tell you what we're modeling. We're modeling for them the true gospel. And that is that Jesus, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, carries a giant eraser. It's called grace. This makes the gospel way bigger than a really good behavioral model, although it's that too. It makes it what it really is, what I just said, grace. The truth is, Jesus loves us as we are, but refuses to leave us as we are. Yeah, amen, right? You guys sometimes feel a little Pentecostal to me. I'm just going to tell you that. I mean, I'm just like, wow, this is, an, this is the kind of progressive, this Adventist church. <laughs> ask you to pause real quick before I close us. I'm going to go for about another eight minutes. Can you stay with me for eight more minutes? Okay. I want you to think back. Close your eyes for just a second. Students, um, junior high, high school, younger kids, moms, dads, grandparents, aunts, uncles. I want you to close your eyes. Please. And I want to ask you to take yourself back to the place that you grew up. Obviously, students, you're there right now. But some of you need to go back. And my question for you is, growing up, fill in the blank, my church and or my home was filled with either grace or rules. It was either filled with grace or rules. It's an important question. Because chances are, most of us have grown up in a place where there was a good amount of rules. And I guess today I'm here to tell you that we kind of had to start moving the needle a little bit more to gospel. The gospel that is called grace. It doesn't mean you throw out the rules. Please hear me very clearly. It does not mean you throw out the rules. But you sure the respect the souls of the young people who are trying to figure it out. Finally, the number one finding in our sticky faith research, as I've learned this, is the more students were involved in intergenerational worship and relationships before graduation, the better they did in college and even returning from college. Again, this denomination does it better than any other denomination I've ever dealt with and worked with. You guys, that's a great arrow in your quiver, okay? But you still have work to do. You do. We all do. <laughs> we all do. Nobody has this figured out yet. But you are a little bit ahead of the curve. Thank you, Jesus. 
May I suggest to you a how-to in terms of how to implement this new paradigm. Um, growing up in, in, in youth groups, certainly in the 80s and 90s, there was a ratio, and the old ratio was one adult to every five kids and that are children, junior high and high school, one adult to every five. And then this brilliant sociologist and researcher and theologian came on the scene. His name is Chap Clark. He's actually at Fuller now. And he wrote a book called Hurt. And he did a ton of research, and what he found is that we had this ratio all wrong. It's not one adult to every five students. It's five adults to every one student. He said, we got to flip this around. Our churches need to flip this around. And so let me tell you what that could mean. Literally, every kid in our community, not just our churches, but in our community, is surrounded with five adults who at least know my name, pray for them, and on some intentional level, cared for them. Why? Because every kid needs to know that there's a team of adults who care for them and know them by name. And here's an idea. Here's just one idea. Start with somebody you know. I have a little four by six prayer card that I read from most days. And next to my son Jack's name and next to my son's Parker name, I have five to one. And I am praying right now, my husband and I are praying for those five adults who will speak into the life of our boys. Now, we just moved like two months ago. So in many ways, we have to start over with that five to one ratio because we want people to be doing life with our boys. But do the kids you know, do they have five? Do they have three? Do they have one? And by the way, this this does not include parents. That's the given. I'll tell you, the one that I definitely have in our life right now is Grandpa Jim. I'm going to try not to cry when I tell you about Grandpa Jim. But my parents are really, really very busy people. They're retired, but they travel all over the country. And my kids are grandkids number nine and ten, so they're a little burnout on the grandparent role. <laughs> We laugh, but honestly, it makes me sad. Good people, good people, love Jesus, but busy. But we have Grandpa Jim, and Grandpa Jim is my husband's dad. And we have Grandma Judy, who's my husband's mom. And they come down and drive down from Pasadena at least once a week. Why? Because Jim gets sticky faith. Jim gets legacy. He gets the passing on of Jesus to his grandkids. And he's, he's raw, he's authentic, but he's intentional. And this is not going to happen, friends, without you being intentional. That is the key to sticky faith, intentionality. And I can't help but wonder, if what if the overall vibe, what if the overall ethos of this church, of Carmichael Church, is one where the children and the students are celebrated and cared for because they matter now, and their faith matters now. And we want them to follow Jesus now and their whole life through without having that moment of crisis of faith because they were allowed and invited to and even welcomed to ask questions of doubt and struggle and sin. What if? What if? There's a great video clip from a, a show that's called Parenthood, where the parents, and you'll notice a few others, are about to adopt this son named Victor. And I'd like you to take a look at this clip and make sure the volume is nice and loud here. Come in. Oh, hi, Your Honor. We have. Uh, hi, we have. Uh, yes, yes, come on in. Braverman. Great. All right, yes, I. There's actually this quite is salsa. He's a lizard. This will take a while. Uh, That's a good idea. Just to. Okay, all right. Come on in. Come in, please. Come in. Okay. Close the door. Okay, everyone, please. Hello, everyone, please. All right, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. <laughs> all right, uh, so Joel and Julia Graham. Yes. Yeah, hi. That's. So now you understand that by signing this adoption agreement form, you agree to uh, take care of Victor as your own legal child, right? To provide for his health, his welfare, his educational needs. We do. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Victor? 
Do you understand? Do you agree to this adoption? Yeah. <laughs> OK, then. <laughs> All right, well, then, unless anyone has anything to add, I'm ready to make it official. <clears throat> Your Honor, yes, if sir. I may. Mm -hmm. As grandparents, my wife, Camille, and myself will do the best we can to, uh, to give Victor what we've given our own children, which is our undying love and support. And also, being a baseball aficionado, uh, <laughs> I would like to teach him the art of fielding the hot grounder. <laughs> okay. But hey, but that can wait till later. And... Uh, Your Honor, I'm sorry. If, if I may, I'm Adam Braverman. I'm Zeke and Camille's oldest son, and I promise to be your uncle. Listen, your, your Aunt Christine and I are no substitute for your stellar parents, but we promise to be there for you no matter what. You can always come to me, Victor, if you need help, and I promise I won't rat you out to your mom. I can give you dating advice. Oh, and then oh, I can yeah. help repair the terrible damage that her what dating is advice what? does. Okay. I'm, I, well, I'm willing to teach you how to ride a motorcycle and play an instrument. Oh, your girl troubles will vanish immediately <laughs> once you know those two things. Yeah. And you can come to my house anytime. We can play Xbox, and you can sleep over and stuff. Now that you're adopted, you can officially hold my lizards. OK. <laughs> I promise to love you, buddy. Yeah. No matter what. Me too. Okay. Okay. It's quite a family you're coming into. All right, on this day, January 24, 2013, Joel and Julia Graham have officially adopted Victor Graham. You're now legally their child. You have all the rights of any natural child. Okay. I will hereby sign this order confirming the adoption. All right. Yeah. Powerful. Friends, can I say something? <laughs> I'm going to because I have the microphone. <laughs> what if, what if Carmichael Church took on the spirit of adoption? <laughs> what if? You began to lead the way for being the church in this community and the surrounding community that says, I'm going to take on that kid. Yeah, they're messy. They're obnoxious. They're a little bit louder than I like them to be. They, are, they, they don't like things in order, and they don't fit in my box. <laughs> but I'm going to take them on. And I'm going to get into their world, and I'm going to speak their love language. Even though I hate baseball, I'm going to go to their baseball games. <laughs> I hate horses, but I'm going to show up at that event. I don't like noise, but I'll show up at the band rehearsal. <laughs> what if you began to inherit the spirit of adoption and live that out here? My friends, you would be expanding the kingdom of God. And I know you have pathfinders and adventurers, correct? Such an adventure land. Adventures. That's Disneyland I was thinking of. <laughs> you have a great start. Your starting block is better than most. Let's keep doing it. I'm going to be here throughout lunch. Benji and I will stay in touch. We can figure out how to do this. But it starts with one person, and that one person is you. So before we close... I want you to write down the initials of one kid you know in your world right now, okay? You can even write down their name, one person. And guess what? If you're a senior in high school, I'm looking over here, or a junior in high school, or yes, yeah, you're in high school, I want you to write down the name of a junior hire or a child. Do you get it? Girls, front row, you understand what I'm talking about. Right now, I want you to write down a name of somebody that you can pour your life into, this is not Megan making this up. This is the word of God. 
Would you stand with me as I close with the word of God this morning? It's from Psalm 78. Take this in. Oh, my people, oh, Carmichael, <laughs> listen to my instruction. Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from your past. Stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of our Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors. Come on up, sweetheart. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so that the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born that they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope on a new God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his command. Amen? Amen. 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 So be it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Megan will be out in the foyer after the service, and then she'll be sticking around for potluck afterwards if you have any questions for her. Now, may we accept her challenge this week that we would help our youth grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man as we live the love of Jesus. Be blessed this week. La 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 la